The next section that we'll be going over is on logarithm functions, which logarithms relate to exponential functions, and they are actually inverse functions, which we'll be talking about later. So, in class we talked about this, so I was just going to get you guys to think about what logarithms are. So, I just had some examples of what you thought x would be, which you guys did this in class, but I'll run through it real quickly. So, if we have two numbers on the same side that contain the same base, that means that their exponents must be equal. So here, if we have 2 to the x equals 2 to the 4th, that means that 2 to the 4th equals 2 to the 4th. So x would be 4. And that makes sense because 2 to the 4th is 2 times 2, which is 4, times 2, which is 8, times 2, which is 16. And 16 will equal 16. Kind of the same idea with number 2. Okay, if we have the same base on both sides, that means that their exponents must be equal. Must be equal. So in this case, your x, your exponent, was negative 2. Now, number 3 was a little different. Um, I was trying to get you to think about 4 to what power will give you 16. So, this one was 4 to the second because 4 times 4 will give you a 16. Okay, so on this one, x is 2. Now, this last one was kind of a tricky question. I was, it was kind of a trick question. Um, without a calculator, okay, you cannot figure out what 5 to what power will give you 7. It's impossible. Okay, so for this one, we had no idea. You're like, what in the world, Miss Long? I don't know how to solve that one. Well, guess what? There is a way to solve that without a calculator, and that is called a logarithm. All a logarithm is is an exponent. Okay, so logarithms will help us to figure out what exponents are that aren't easy to solve for, like in this case. That's when they're really helpful. In other cases, we can kind of figure it out, like in 1 through 3, but the cases where we can't just figure it out off the top of our head, that is where logarithms will save us, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So in order to find what the exponent is, we have to get x on one side by itself. So we kind of have to get the exponent out of the exponent somehow. And the way we do that is through a logarithm. So we'll be doing something called converting from an exponential form to a logarithm form. Okay, and if you see here, okay, the exponent, like in the last one on the previous, the exponent is what we didn't know. We didn't know what x was. That's the exponent. Okay, but if you see here, the exponent in this scenario is y. When we convert this thing to a logarithm, y is, in fact, on one side by itself. So we can solve for the exponent. So when we're solving for an exponent that we don't know, we must convert it from exponential form to logarithm form. So let's just review some parts of the exponential equation. So on the left-hand side over here. So if you remember, the c is called the base. Okay, which logarithms also have bases. This little c right here below the log is also the base. So the base of your exponential becomes the base of the logarithm. Okay, and on this side, I'm going to explain what this notation means. So the way you say this is log base c of x, whatever's in the parentheses you say, of that value equals y. Okay, so be careful. This c right here is not like c raised to the x power. No, that is not what that is, okay? This is, the x value is inside of your logarithm. So this is log base c, this little number down here is the base, of x equals y. Okay, so this will allow us to solve for our exponent that we don't know. It's pretty cool, right? So the way that you can kind of think about doing this, there's two different ways, which I'll show you both ways. Okay, one way, Okay, the base of the log is going to be the base, I'm sorry, the base of the exponential is going to be the base of the log. And if you notice here, the y and x kind of switch sides of your equal sign. The y was with the base, but now the y is on the opposite side of the equation. The x was not with your base, but now it's kind of hanging out with the base. So the base stays the same with the log and the exponential, and your y and x hop over the equal sign or trade places. So that's kind of one way to think about it. Another way is kind of like a roundabout way. So again, you start with the base of the exponential. So we have log base c of x, log base c of x equals y. So you can also visualize it as this kind of roundabout thing. 
So you start with the base, log base C cross the equal sign of X cross the equal sign equals Y. So either way you see it, either X and Y trade places or you kind of do this roundabout thing around the equal sign. Whichever way makes sense, you need to remember because it's very important to convert from a exponential to a log and later on we'll talk about how to convert from a logarithm to an exponential. It'll be fun times. So these are going to be example problems on how to convert from an exponential to a logarithm, which will be using the technique we discussed on the previous slide. So go ahead and pause the video and start example one, part A and B. Now the next thing we're going to talk about is very similar to what we just discussed. Sometimes we need to get things out of the logarithm, so it's helpful to convert to an exponential. So it's kind of the same idea when you convert from a logarithm to an exponential. The base of the log, the little guy next to the log, is the base of your exponential. So your bases stay the same. And then like before, your x and your y trade spots. So your y hops with the base, okay, and then the x hops to the other side of the equal sign. So that's one way to think about it. Okay, so the base stays the same, the other two values trade places. Or, if you prefer the roundabout method, you start with the base, so the base of the log is C, so C raised to the Y power, so cross that equal sign, equals X. Sorry guys. C to the Y power equals X. So again, you can kind of do that roundabout way if that makes sense to you. So you cross the equal sign and then cross the equal sign. So whatever makes sense to you, that's what you need to use when you convert from one form to the other. Okay, converting is very essential when we start solving for logarithms and exponentials. So you must have this part down. So our next examples, example 2 part A and B, is just like the last one except we're going the opposite way. So we'll be starting with a logarithm and converting that bad boy into an exponential. So go ahead and pause the video and watch example 2 part A and B. Now these next example problems are on solving logarithms. So we want to know what the value of this thing right here is. Okay, it actually is a pretty number when you get done. So example three and four will be on solving for what these values of the logarithms will be. So go ahead and pause the video and try example three and four. Now, example 5 and 6 are basically the same thing as your last problems. The only thing different, if you notice, in this one, the base of our logarithm is a fraction, which fractions are our friends, okay, which it requires an extra step or two when you have a fraction. So I just kind of wanted to show you kind of a different approach to the problem in case you have a fraction. So example 5 will have a fraction in the base, and example 6 will have a fraction within the log. So go ahead and pause the video and watch example 5 and 6. Okay, so the next kind of log is a special logarithm. This is called a common logarithm. Common logarithms are the most common logarithms you see, hence the name. Okay, they, uh, they are used the most often. And also, they're really easy to type in your calculator, um, which we'll go over that in the problem. Um, but anyways, a common logarithm is when the base is not written and the base is going to be 10. So if you see down here in the example, mathematicians are super lazy. Okay, if we don't have to write something, we're not going to write it. Okay, and since the common log base 10 is the most common base there is, we usually just leave off the base. Okay, so if you see a log that doesn't have a base, like here it's log 40, you're probably like, holy hot dog, Miss Long, where's the base? Well, guess what? If you don't see a base, there's secretly a 10 hiding out there. So you could just write in a 10 if it makes you feel better. Okay, but you will see logarithms written without the 10, so you do need to get used to uh, uh, using the logs without the 10. But if it does help you, you can go ahead and write a 10 in if you don't see a base. So, example 7 and 8, they're pretty much the same thing as examples 3 through 6. You're just working with the base 10 now. Okay, so since we don't see a base here, secretly the base is 10. So go ahead and pause the video and work example 7 and 8. Okay, so the next nifty properties we'll be talking about are our identity properties with logarithms. So, 
We did a nifty activity in class to kind of explore how this works. So you should have noticed in class, whenever the base of the log is the same as the number inside of the log, that bad boy always equals one. Okay, so you're looking for that repetition from the base to the number inside of the log. Okay, and the reason why that is, okay, if we convert this thing into an exponential, b raised to the first power equals b. Anything to the first power is itself. So that's why when the base of the log and the number in the log are the same, it will equal 1. Remember, you guys, logarithms are exponents. So the exponent, something to get, when you raise a number to a power and you want to get itself, that power must be a 1. So that kind of explains that one. And the next one, when there is a 1 inside that logarithm, it always equals 0. And the reason why, if I convert this into an exponential b raised to the zero power. Anything raised to the zero power will always equal one. Always. Every single time. Okay, so anything to the zero power is one. So that's why when one is inside the log, okay, it's going to be zero because anything raised to the zero will give you a one. So that's kind of explains that. Okay, so now we're going to be talking about graphs of logarithms, which logarithm graphs relate directly to exponential graphs because they are besties, otherwise they are called inverses. Okay, so they're inverses, but they're also besties, so they kind of relate to each other. Okay, so we're going to start with exponential growth. We're going to kind of review those properties, and we're going to compare them to what the logarithm growth looks like. Okay, so first of all, remember back when we did exponentials, this is a growth because your base is larger than 1. Okay, same with the logarithm. If your base of the log is greater than 1, it will be a logarithm growth. How exciting. So let's kind of compare the characteristics of each graph. So if you look at exponential to logarithms, they are both increasing. If you look at the graphs, if you go from left to right, this one is going uphill, it's increasing. And if you go from left to right here, this one is increasing, just not as quickly as that one. Okay, so they both increase, pretty nifty, right? Now, since these are inverses, remember with inverse functions, your x and your y values are constantly interchanging. Remember that fancy word. Okay, so that means if you had a y, your y becomes an x. Or if you have an x, your x becomes a y. So with the asymptote for exponentials, it was y equals 0. But since our x and y interchange, when we go to the asymptote of the logarithm graph, it now is an x equal. So the y changed to the x. Okay, and an x equals 0, that is the equation of the y-axis. So our asymptote is now on the y-axis. So it was on the x-axis for exponential, but now it is on the y-axis. All right, let's compare common points. So again, remember when we did inverse functions to get our inverse points, we had to interchange our original points. So we had to flip-flop all of our x's and our y-values. So if you see here, all of our points look very similar, except our x and y's have traded spots. My 0, 1 turned into a 1, 0. My 1c turned into a c1, and my negative 1, 1 over c, turned into a 1 over c, negative 1. So the points are the same, they just interchange, the x and the y. Okay, and then finally, for domain and range, okay, let's review the domain of exponential and why it is what it is. So domain, remember you ask yourself, how far left does it go, which this graph heads in the negative infinity direction for forever. And then you ask yourself, how far right does it go? Which this graph does head to the right for forever. It doesn't look like it, but it does get wider and wider. I pinky promise. Okay, and if you look over to your logarithm graph, if you notice, the domain is the same as the range in your logarithm graph. And if you remember from when we did inverse functions, your domain and range also interchange. Holy hot dog. So let's see if that works in our graph. So the range, you ask yourself, how low does the graph go? Which, this graph heads to negative infinity. It heads downward for forever, so watch out. It's with the demon cats. And then you ask yourself, how high does the graph go? Okay, well, even though it doesn't look like it's getting that high up, it does steadily increase for forever, so it will eventually reach 
infinity. So the range will go to positive infinity. All right, and the next thing, let's see if I can get it back to its normal screen. All right, so now let's look at the range of the exponential. So let's refresh the range. You ask yourself, how low does the graph go? Which it gets really close to zero on the y-axis, but it does not touch because of this lovely asymptote that's sitting in the way. Okay, so that's why we have the parentheses because it can't equal to zero. Okay, then you ask yourself, how high does the graph go? Well, it shoots off to positive infinity, so to infinity and beyond with Buzz Lightyear. So that was our domain and range for exponential. But if you notice, if you click over, all right, that is the same thing as the domain for the logarithm graph. Isn't that exciting? So our range became our domain, and our domain became the range. So the domain and range have interchanged. And let's make sure that works. So our domain, we asked yourself, how far left does the graph go? Okay, well, if we go to how far left, the graph gets really close to zero on the x, but it does not touch because of our asymptote sitting in the way. And then you ask yourself, how far right does the graph go? Okay, which this graph will head to the right for forever. I know there's not an arrow here. There technically should be. Okay, so it does extend to infinity and beyond. So what has happened is our domain and range also interchanged, just like what happened with our inverse graphs. Isn't that cool, you guys? Okay, so when we graph these functions, it will actually be very similar to when we graph these with our inverse functions. Okay, so before we do that, let's run through exponential decay and logarithm decay, which is going to be very similar to what we just did, so I'll kind of go through it a little faster. So remember, exponential decay... Okay, that's when your base was a fraction, something in between 0 and 1. Okay, same with the logarithm. If your base is in between 0 and 1, it will be logarithm decay. Okay, so let's compare the characteristics real quickly. Okay, between both graphs, they both decrease. If you notice, when you go from left to right, we're going downhill here, we're headed downward. And here, when we go left to right, we are heading downward, so they both are decreasing. Our asymptotes have interchanged just like the last time. For exponentials, it's y equals 0. Logarithms, it's now x equals 0. Fun time. Okay, our three points that we graph also interchange. Okay, so they're very similar to exponential. You just change your x and your y. And then the domain and range, kind of the same thing happens. We go from negative infinity to positive infinity on our exponential graph for our domain. And the domain becomes the range of the new graph, which if you notice, it does head down to negative infinity. Now, it doesn't look like it, but this does steadily decrease, so it will eventually reach negative infinity, unfortunately. Okay, and then it does shoot off to positive infinity on the y-axis. It goes up to infinity. That does keep going up for forever. And now for our range in our original graph, it does go down to zero, but it doesn't touch zero because of our asymptote. And it does shoot off to infinity. Um, that's how high it goes. That little line there means it keeps going up for forever. And if you notice, that does become the domain of the logarithm graph. Holy hot dog. And let's just double check that real quickly. So the domain, this is saying that our, our smallest x value is not quite zero, but almost zero. So let's see. Look at that. When we go to the left, if you look up here, kind of where the green arrow is, the graph gets really close to zero on the x, but it does not touch because of our asymptote. And then, when we ask ourselves how far to the right does it go, this graph is headed off to positive infinity on the x-axis. So, our domain and range also interchange. So, kind of the same idea from the last one. Alright, so when we graph these, it's going to be very similar to when we graphed inverse equations because exponentials and logarithms are inverses. So we're going to be starting with exponential functions. We're going to graph them like we did in section 1 of the unit. And then, kind of using properties from section 2 of our unit, we're going to convert that thing into its inverse, which should be a logarithm. And then we're going to graph it. And remember, since these are inverses, they should be symmetrical to the line y equals x when we get done. So this is going to be a lot of fun. So you guys go ahead and pause the video and work on example 9 and example 10. And this is a wonderful funsie we're going to be working on later. That's it, you guys. 
Hope you had a blast. I certainly did.